Welcome everyone. I played up to Mythic this past week and um, my voice wasn't feeling great so I decided to just do footage without me recording my voice and so here I am after the fact recording my voice over the footage that I have already created previously so it'll probably sound a little bit different. Uh, I'll still be talking about all my picks. I'll still be talking about all the gameplay and why I'm doing things. It just won't be my voice at the time of actually playing. And I also decided to speed up the footage so that you can watch more content uh, at a faster pace. I also curated the game so that you are watching the most interesting games from the deck, uh, whether my opponent's doing something interesting or I'm doing something interesting. I just took out all the fluff filler games that um, were not as interesting. So it's basically the gameplay is the best of the best and the drafts were the ones that got me to the top. So enjoy and I will walk you through all my picks. There are three different drafts so if you want to just go to the draft just see the timestamps below and you'll be able to select uh, one draft, two draft, three drafts. So there's three different drafts in this. Uh, three different decks playing. Uh, should be fun. Let's jump into draft number one. You know obviously in this pack uh, tireless tracker is just absolutely broken. I'm definitely taking it from the list over the rookie or the tipster but yeah it's an easy tracker every time here. Um, I couldn't imagine ever taking something over it. Interesting pick here though. Um, I did debate the land for quite a bit, um, but Dogwalker is just such a strong card and a little bit versatile because we could go uh, red or white with it. Um, you know, I'm not really thrilled about my choices here, but at the end of the day, I think Dogwalker is completely reasonable to take. I think you could also take the land here. It was really between the two. But Dog Walker just edges it out for me. After taking Dog Walker, I think Season Consultant looks like a good two drop. Um, just want to make sure I get enough two drops in my deck in this format. Um, whether it's a creature or a ramp, just something to do on turn two is really important. Interesting pick here. Um, I actually decided to cut off green because I am noticing green is not getting past me and I do want to try and play my tracker so I decided sample collector is just good enough to take but I was tempted by make your move and some of the other cards as well um, but I am trying to block out green there and of course punished because there's still no green um, so just kind of soft forcing it there but it didn't really work out. Uh, I just take a trick in white since clearly the most open color is white so far. Make your move or Vengeful Creeper. I think they're pretty similar. I think I end up taking the Creeper here over Make Your Move, but um, I, I think you could make the argument to take the white card instead, but again, I'm trying to cut off green just a touch. Um, auspicious Arrival number two, not excited about it though. Here, um, I could take the case. I could take a black card or unauthorized exit, but I think uh, I end up going with just the land public thoroughfare because it just leaves me the most options later since this start is not exactly the strongest start I could have. Uh, again, I'm just going to take the case here. Um, fixing leaves me open later in the draft. This pick doesn't really matter. I think I take chases on just because it's on color with the dog walker thinking cap same thing just kind of flexible card that can make a deck um i don't plan on playing the phantom but it's a good white playable if i fall short open tasa yeah so now i'm white black x um red is looking like the cut so dog walker is going to be a double white card some white cards here that i'm passing that i'm not happy about but hey they could wheel um into a uh, Wisp Drinker Vampire is pretty nice, Tasa into Vampire. So I'm pretty okay with jumping into White Black here. Uh, black did seem a little bit open in pack one, so I'm not nervous about it. Um, novice Inspector is really easy here. Um, I couldn't imagine taking anything else since we're just so into white. Watchdog's actually reasonable. Um, again, you could take Make Your Move, but I'm going to take the Watchdog just because I do kind of want to go wide. And huge reward here with Inside Source and Consultant to pick from. I take the Inside Source, of course, because it is the better card. Um, but it is a 3-drop. And now green's kind of looking like a splash, so I'm just going to move those cards over to the side is how I do it. And um, that's just kind of my maybe pile. And then my core deck is on the left of the land. Um... 
Snarling Gorehound isn't exciting, but it fits my deck at the moment, so that's what I'm going to do. This one, you could take almost anything here. I end up taking the land, uh, but I think the Dual Leech or the uh, Morowai would have been fine. Researcher or Snoop. Um, I think Researcher is really good, like really good, top card. So I take it over the Snoop, but um, I don't know if that was the correct pick. Like in hindsight, that one was a risky pick that maybe I didn't need to take. Uh, Wrench is fine since we're doing artifacts, same with Case. Um, since we're doing artifacts and then some nice graveyard recursion here is a great pickup. Um, and I actually take the Snuffler here, um, mainly because we're looking like a clue deck and it could pop off in that kind of deck. Um, lots of green, uh, lots of white, and a land. So I am considering this land very heavily just because it splashes the tracker, but I end up taking the Novice Inspector over the gatekeeper because it does make a clue and if we're going to be leaning into clues um, it's just a better card for my deck than even the gatekeeper is. Into a Delny, like huge reward. Um, I'm already playing two power or less matters so Delny could just really pop off in this deck and um, yeah there's nothing else here that I'm that interested in over it so I end up taking the Delny. I want the on the job to wheel but I don't think it will. Um, inside source number two, now that we have Delny, and uh, Whisk Drinker is great. Really safe to say that we're now locked into this plan. Um, I don't know if I'm splashing uh, blue or green, but one of the two, or if not both. Uh, deadly cover-up is very nice to see. I love a deadly cover-up. Uh, any board wipe in this format is just amazing. Not ready to commit to blue, and there's no white card I want, so I'm going to just take the uh, slice from the shadows as just a little bit more interaction. A second deadly cover up. I mean, I'm not opposed to two board wipes. I actually think it's more consistent, um, so I take it, and that means the tracker is less good, and it makes the case of the Village Falcon a lot better because it's technically a creature we can crew value for and then activate after the board wipe so that's one of those like situations where the tracker's infinitely better card I end up taking the snoop here but the tracker's infinitely better card than the case but in this particular deck with two board wipes I actually don't want the tracker on board you know land is great because um, I'm going to be splashing here agents perfectly reasonable double trigger with delny a second watchdog's okay. Um, not thrilled about it, but it's fine. And, I mean, this is the deck. The other thing that the uh, playing blue instead of green does is that the fairy snoop has a small chance to just be played out as well. So, several reasons to ditch the green there, um, even though tracker is just so strong. But um, I think I ended up in the right place, and I actually think the case of the Filch Falcon was the correct choice over the tracker, as uh, crazy as that may seem. Uh, this is the deck I run, and it looks great. Um, I end up going one more planes, since I do want my inspector to land early, and I end up cutting the thinking cap. I think at this moment I'm just kind of like second guessing with three thoroughfares. Could I still play the tracker? And I think you could. You know, I still have three sources for it, but I actually end up thinking the Snuffler's better here with the wrench and cutting the cap and the case of the Shattered Pack is better. And yes, this is a Snuffler deck. Like, you're about to see it. A Snuffler deck, okay? Um, yeah. With this many clues, Snuffler gets huge right away and the wrench is what it buys back. It gets Vigilance. So you can just read that as a five mana, five, five Vigilant creature that gets bigger. So... I think it's perfectly reasonable here. Game one, and we are against a green deck. So my plan here is to try and get them to deploy as many resources as possible with me deploying as few as possible and falling as little behind as I possibly can before I deadly cover up. So I already know with two deadly cover ups, I'm always gonna pretty much play to a board wipe. Uh, a little bit of misclick there, but the idea of playing to a board wipe is I don't want to tip them off that there's something, you know, wrong afoot. 
Um, but I also don't want to fall down to 10 life, right? So there's a fine balance to be had, and I actually end up passing here to see what they do. Um, if they play out another creature, then obviously I'm going to go ahead and uh, board wipe. But if they don't, we might have to play out another creature to bait them into playing more of theirs. See, and they hold. So they definitely know what's up. So now I have to play my creature out, and I think that's okay. It's a little bit of a bait. Like, it's me saying I'm willing to give up my Wisp Drinker Vampire to get one more card out of your hand. And it ended up being a binding instead of a creature, and that's fine. Um, still another card out of hand. We are down to 10, so I do need to actually board wipe here. It's not optional. But luckily we have a uh, Delny with inside source next turn. So double trigger on the inside source is going to be nice. And all of a sudden we have stabilized in a really nice fashion. Um, Pretty sure that face down card is quite large, so I am willing to double block. I am also sure they have a trick here. It's okay if they take both of our two twos. I want to get the tricks out of hand, um, and we have the snoop coming up next turn. We can draw two cards off of it. Look four deep, draw two cards. Seems good. Yeah, there's the trick. I was a little bit more upset that it was a dog walker that they were able to still get value off of. And I ended up going with the agent to make them discard two of their last three cards. Again, just disgusting value here. And there it goes. They say nice. Yeah, it was very nice. So I'm just going to lead off and draw two cards. Nice Tesa. And uh, I mean, now things look great. So Tesa kind of takes over here. I can attack him with my Snoop, play her out, get my clue. I get two clues because of Delny. Yeah. And... Um, it gets pretty nuts. <laughs> so this is called popping off with Delny and Tesa. End up double blocking here, I think. Their man is tapped. It's pretty safe double block. Giving up my agent and my spirit. And there's our blue source, and then they quit. It's okay, we had it. Um, but yeah, it was a cool game to kind of see Delny do its thing. On to the next game, which is against Nate, number four. And looked good. Um, we're on the play, so I'm actually going to play all my creatures out on curve and try and curve out. And if it doesn't work out, we'll deadly cover up after. Um, but when you're on the play, even with a board wipe, I do think there is a lot of temptation for you to not to do what I'm doing. Um, but I do want them to play cards and need to play cards to keep up. So I think it's really reasonable to go ahead and curve out and get going. And then passing here kind of tells me that they might have a counter, and I'm okay with them countering the agent. Um, they end up playing the panther, which is fine, so maybe they don't have the counter, but I'm definitely um, keeping my eye out for uh, mutation, just given that the first two colors played were uh, blue and green. So, um, And they chose not to play out the two drop like that's the other giveaway there is they they discard a two drop they chose not to play out and then they play out this two drop so um, they definitely had a two drop in hand that they decided to actively pass on which tells me they had a counter and I don't think it was mutation um, now I'm thinking it's reasonable doubt so I need to play around reasonable doubt for the rest of the game uh, for anything important because they will obviously be able to counter it 
I no longer have any good attacks, so now's the time when, like, I don't need to add to the board anymore. Like, I'm just going to sit back and wait for them to come at us um, until we board wipe and try and maximize that, so... And they passed, which is also super sus. And like I said, they definitely have a counter spell. They definitely have reasonable doubt. So I'm not going to play anything to the board. We also have a board wipe. They could have a board wipe as well. Um, they do end up having a board wipe, spoiler alert. Uh, but, you know, I'm sitting there in the back of my mind going, you know, we're both kind of playing cat and mouse at this point. Um, but we're, we're perfectly okay with our deck just sitting back and chilling as long as we're not falling behind on board. So, um no rush. That's a problem card though. Um, a 3-3 flyer could solo us if I'm not careful, so I need to not play too many games. I actually decide to try and bait some action here. Um, this play is pretty questionable. I'm about to make a really bad attack um, on purpose, and it's because I want them to attack me back. Um, to give Tesa an opening for next turn. So if I draw land, I play around their counter and Tesa can land and I can draw a clue. And that's the turn I'm really setting up for. So that was a bad attack. I'm letting them eat my creatures. I already know I have a board wipe I'm going to play, but if I can get Tesa going, it's totally worth it. And yeah, I mean, I'm not blocking this. But all likewise, they're holding open their counter. We did draw the land, which is perfect. So now we get in for three. I'm going to make a clue. And yes, Tesa does get killed by our board wipe, but remember, remember, we do have a lot of graveyard recursion, and their colors does not, so I'm pretty confident about this. So this is just us playing around the counter spell, um, and basically baiting them into attacking us back with a bad attack on our end. Um, we ended up at basically the same life total at the end, um, and now we'll get chump blockers for the 3-3. So that's, uh, that was the goal. He took a very long time to think here, like the entire clock, and time actually ran out on him. Um, so I don't know what was going on there, but, um, oops, yeah, like I don't know if he uh, left the room or, or what was going on, but that was um, a little bit interesting. Uh, I still am putting him on that counter, I'm still putting him on maybe a board wipe, I am definitely know he has the counter though. Um, and I also have board wipe as well. So like at this point, I want to fork his board wipe first while still not overextending. So I'm willing to give up my gore hound and my inspector here for my surveil, which I want to keep that card and to be able to just kind of take control of the board and say, well, if you don't board wipe, you're going to be in a problem next turn. So Sometimes you do have to create a problem to force big cards out, and um, I don't think you should be scared to do that, um, because if I look at it, my follow-up is pretty good with Inside Source and the Snuffler, um, and also we're going to get a Slice from the Shadows. So, so this is a really interesting play by them. Um, they're making a 3-5, and then they do Ill-Timed Explosion. So I'm hoping at this point that they discard a 4-mana spell. Because if they do, we can blow them out with Slice. This is me, like, absolutely praying it's a 4-mana spell. <laughs> and not 3. And it was. It was a four mana spell. So um, it doesn't matter if we crack the clue now or crack it afterwards. Um, either way, we're not going to get a spirit out of it. So they wipe. They were expecting to have a three five after. No thank you. So that was a really good turn for us. And now we can start taking over. 
Um, I am going to play out my inside source, and uh, yeah, we just have control over the board white now. Theirs is out of hand, we still have ours left, we actually still have two left. Um, satchel is not what I want to see though. Again, flyers, so I am going to have to make attacks um, to go into the satchel, and I, my original plan was sack the wrench, get it back with Snuffler this turn. That was my original line. Satchel kind of changes that where I actually want the wrench because the wrench makes my attacks better. Um, and I need to force them to block so that they don't get too much value, especially now that they play this card, right? So now they have a 2-4 and they're going to have a 1-1. One, one. So the only way I can attack into them profitably and take both creatures is if I keep my wrench and use inside source to pump my detective and my detective have the wrench as well. So, um, obviously not a very mana efficient turn for me because I didn't get to do the combo I wanted. Um, but this is still going to be a really good turn. So this is me just kind of pointing out that inside source is going to do the pump and then it's a it's a great attack so um unfortunately we can't do the waltz and pump um still a good attack even without the uh waltz being able to do its thing Among Us is a good card, um, obviously problematic. There is some temptation to just board wipe now, um, but I also think I need to consider just baiting for one more turn and um, it's probably worth it to take four damage and, um, and try and bait out a little bit more action from them. Um, so I, I just decide to equip my wrench and offer your two tokens for my one inside source and see if they take it. And if they do, now we can do the reconstruction turn. Um, so we still have a good turn after this. And they definitely took it, as expected. Um, I, I think that's the right play for sure. So um, Tapping the goblin doesn't work because obviously it'll untap during their turn. So don't do that. But we do get to get back some creatures. Um, taste is an absolute must. Uh, but the second creature I get, I am actually looking at something like Agent here. Um, they have two cards left in hand, and I want them to have fewer resources. So I'm going to go ahead and play this. And I know they have a counter still, remember. So this is basically forking their counter. Exactly. So now that the counter is out of the way, we definitely have the ability to do the board wipe freely. Um, and we'll have Tesa and the Snuffler as a follow-up with Wrench making an immediate spirit. So, a um, little annoying that Satchel has so much value still on the board, but um, we have two board wipes if we need to. So, not too concerned. And then they do this. And I'm like, wow. I mean, they overextended. That's brutal. Um, so they just have two one ones and two more draws with 14 cards left in library. Um, and we have Tesa with Delny now. So um, even with Satchel, I'm feeling really good. And uh, this is when they just kind of quit. <laughs> uh, I think they decided that uh, being board wiped after extending to the board was GG. Um, so good game. Um I end up sacking the wrench, which was a kind of a big whoops because uh, otherwise we would have made a spirit. Uh, I didn't say oops, but it doesn't matter. Um, they were off the game anyway because the board wipe was a little bit brutal. So, GG. And, uh, you know, decks 2 0. 
So the games are fun. Uh, I This is my first time I ever had Devil Board Wipe in a uh, deck for the set. And um, yeah, I enjoyed it. I was a little concerned that two would be excessive, but I, I don't think it is. So our opponent's going uh, fast, and obviously our deck doesn't like our opponents to go fast, so um, they're also on the play. So it's not looking good. Um, I decide to uh, slice to prevent two damage, just to slow things down. Um, again, not thrilled, but I have to slow them down a little bit. Lead on inside source and try and get some damage in for Tesa. It hurts. So now we have to do our comeback. <laughs> Which is fine. There's no reason to hide Tesa because, you know, they're tapped out. I've already decided um, I'm blocking with Tesa if they attack him with their Volt Strider. Um, I need to put a stop to it. I don't have a good way of removing it at the moment. Uh, even with a board wipe, it doesn't do it. So since I have a reconstruction in hand, a way to get back Tesa, it's a decent trade for me to make. And they play Coat. Coat puts me on a really fast clock, so, um, yeah, I need to start pushing. And I go ahead and make the trade. I mean, I don't think I had a choice not to with Coat on board. Now, remember, their Goat can't block. So there's really no way for them to lose a creature here. Um, so I just decide to uh, sacrifice the wrench, get it in the grave, and see what we draw into. Luckily it's a board wipe. And uh, I just decide to chill because even blocking one damage could matter here. So. Love seeing that they extend to the board one turn further. Um, they are a little bit mana poor, so Coat's not nearly as big of a threat once the creature is dead for my board wipe. Crack for Clue because mana efficiency. And yeah, I mean, there's no reason not to attack in, and there's no reason to not board wipe here. So that's definitely the play. I think part of the trick of playing like a really good control board wipe deck is understanding when are you winning the board and when are you losing it and when is it like completely out of control right um, because you're always going to be kind of riding that line of like how far behind am I willing to fall before I do this how much value do I want to get out of this and um, you know sometimes you do wait too late and and I'm not thrilled that I'm at five life here I mean that's way more than I wanted to take, but they had a really good aggressive start and um, I felt like I did everything I could to just stop the onslaught. I was so relieved that they decided not to do coat to hand and then uh, play out coat next turn because they would still have, you know, pretty much three turn, four turn clock if they did that, so. Vampire is such a good draw um, because it'll allow us to gain back some life and uh, 
have a chance at at least stabilizing through gaining a little bit of life against the coat. Um, without it, there's no chance, so um, I was relieved to draw the vampire, and I'm definitely playing it out. Clue. Perfect draw. Okay. So obviously I want to maximize the amount of life I'm gaining and the amount of damage I can push before uh, we need to board wipe again if we have to. Um, obviously board wiping with coat is not good um, and they are leaving two open so they will be returning the coat to hand. Um, so at this point it's just how much damage can I push? Getting back Tesa and Inspector, mainly because Inspector can allow me to double cast this turn and uh, will also trigger and allow me to draw another card. So it's just really good on all fronts. So I'm putting them on having a trick, so I need to block two creatures uh, for chases on, right? Um, assuming they're going to kill Tesa. The good news about that move is that they didn't play out coat, so that actually buys us more time um, in a weird way. But yeah, I mean the whole idea is tread water, gain as much life, drain as much life, push as much damage, because that coat, I can't block that coat, so. Um, We've done a good job. Like, we're back up to eight. They're now at eight. Um, just keeping the priorities correct was the key here to get to this point. So, these are forced blocks, in my opinion. And now we put them in a situation where they don't know it, but they also have a forced block. So the uh, dog walker is lethal if they don't block it. Um, if they do block it, we're still in an okay spot because we do have a good follow-up with the snuffler. Um, obviously, I need to be concerned about what their other face down card is, but there's no reason for me to turn this face up before combat, even though it gives it vigilance. I was considering it because of the vigilance, right? It can also block at that point, but um, I'd rather go for the win here if they decide to get greedy. And they took a while to decide whether they wanted to block this or not, so I think that was definitely the right choice. Uh, but giving up the vigilance uh, did hurt for sure. They did block, which is the right choice, obviously. Um, we flip to ping for two and gain two. Um, it's not lethal, obviously, um, even with the arrival. So we have to pass and let it all resolve. But we do have lethal next turn. Um, so we're just going to put out our snuffler as a nice blocker. It does get back the wrench, so... It happened, and we also have two clues on board to make it a 7-7, seven, seven. so. Snuffler doing things for the first time. And just so you know, like, I've already put that face down card as either being the bull rack, double strike 3-2, or uh, offender at large, uh, the 5-4 that pumped something else for two, so I 
have left my blockers this whole entire game uh, and made my blocks based on assuming that's what that card is. Of course it could be something else, but that's what my assumption has been uh, pretty much the whole game. From my point of view, they don't have a good attack. I think they're debating uh, whether to return the coat to their hand and get another creature on board or whether they should flip their face down card um, and attack in. But I think they're realizing if they attack in, they just lose on the back crack, so they can't really spend the five mana to flip whatever their face down card is. I imagine it's an expensive one. So they end up returning the coat and getting another creature, which I think is um, probably the right move for their situation. Because uh, they don't know I have Auspicious Arrival just sitting in hand. So. Just kind of showing off what the Snuffler can do. Um, since, you know, I don't think anybody besides me plays with it in this format. <laughs> uh, but I've, I've played with it a a bit and I don't mind it so um showing what the snuffler can do because remember I already drew a card from the wrench bought it back now I have a 6-6 six, six vigilance creature that can become a 7-7 seven, seven. I don't even think they realize that when they block like this because like technically I could sack a clue and it not die but we already have lethal anyway so it's gg But that was a cool game to um, come back from Five Life and uh, just kind of show how a grindy deck can uh, get there in the end. Playing a turn one novice inspector always feels absolutely amazing. Some temptation to not uh, run out my tap land so that I can sack the clue, but I decided against that. A little bit punished because they played Tracker. Um, but what are you going to do? Did not bite. I want to play my Auspicious Arrival. A little bit punished here. Perfect. So the reason why I'm not playing to the board is obviously because I have a board wipe and I am planning on drawing a land to get out of it. I let my case solve first though before cracking the clue, um, which means I miss my land drop this turn, but I should get it next turn. Um, so I'm not too concerned. Loved seeing that they uh, discarded the person of interest. I was like, what is that? Um, but yeah, we need to sack a clue. Hope we get a land. We are taking two from the tracker to do so. There it is. And um, yeah, there's no fooling around here. There's not even a good like pretend attack to attack in for one. So let's just decide to board wipe, not even play games. And uh, the best part about this is we have, you know, this is why we're playing blue over green, right? Tireless Tracker would be gone now, whereas uh, Case of the Filch Falcon is going to give us a 4-4 flyer next turn. Um, so it's absolutely incredible, comparatively, when you're playing double board wipe in your uh, deck. 
So I kind of have a, a choice to make whether I want to sack the case or hold open a trick. Um, decide to sack the case and equip for Vigilance, making it a 5-5. Five, five. Uh, mainly because um, 5 damage spells are pretty hard to come by. I mean, it's basically like Galvanize and Slice from Shadows. A uh, little risky, obviously, because I can't sack the clue creature for value if they do have uh, another mana and slice or something. So, not like the safest play, but um, I just enjoyed the efficiency and I'm not blocking this. <laughs> um, problematic cards get dropped. So, I mean, good thing it has vigilance from the wrench, so... There's uh, no reason for me not to attack in, but I do need to be mindful about tricks to hold up. Delny is going to need to block the 2-1, but I can keep pushing. Um, so I feel like we're in an okay spot, even though it's a little bit precarious. So we have to block the four in case they have the chases on. But holding open double auspicious arrival feels nice. They did have the slice, but they only had it for four. Um, so we can double auspicious to completely negate it. Um, I'm just deciding whether I want to save my Delny or my uh, Flyer. And because they have the Phoenix, I decide I absolutely need to uh, save the Flyer instead of Delny. And uh, luckily we have like a million clue value now. Um, I decide not to sack the other clue because it's if they have fish... I need a blocker on the ground and, you know, the novice inspector can buy me one more turn doing that. So, um, that's why I often do that instead of, uh, roll the dice on another clue. And now I do have to trade. Absolutely have to trade. Um, so yeah, we, we have to win this turn. Um, and the drinker does it. <laughs> um, perfect draw because now Delny will allow it to trigger twice, and then the inspector will become not blockable. Um, decide to equip my wrench to my uh, drinker for no good reason, but yeah, they're just dead on board. So that was a fun deck. It, it did end up trophying, um, going 7-2, but yeah. Double deadly cover up with a uh, magnetic snuffler was a pretty cool, uh, fun little build. So let's jump into the next draft here. Um, see what we do here. Uh, not the opening pack you want to see. I tend to lean towards uh, fixing and removal above all. So. Buried in the Garden is a good top choice here. I think you could take the Researcher or the Inside Source or the Glint Weaver or even the Deadly Complication if you wanted to, but I like Buried in the Garden and rewarded with the Case of the Locked Hothouse. I don't know why people keep passing this card. Um, it just wins the game. I like it. So um, I don't care what anybody else says. I love Case of the Locked Hothouse. I will not pass that card very often. Uh, there would have to be a better rare in the pack. Killer Among Us is better than all of these. I'm a little concerned that all of my picks are 4 mana or more at the moment. Um, but luckily, enchantments can be cast off the case. So it's okay to have enchantments. I want to try and minimize my instants and sorceries, but there is no other good card for me to take here except for not on my watch, so I end up taking that. Um, you could take the Hellion if you'd prefer. Um, or even the Cold Case Cracker if you want to lock into Bant, um, since I already know I like to play four or five colors. So, um, any of those cards would have been fine. Reward with an inside source. So it's a dog walker. So this is actually a pretty difficult pick, right? The dog walker is stronger, but slower. 
uh, inside source is weaker, but faster. Um, I don't know what kind of deck I'm going to be yet, and uh, it's even possible we don't play white, so Dogwalker is more flexible um, in that it could be just red or just white. So I'm going to take Dogwalker over inside source, but it's close. I love a good Extract the Confession. Um, it is my favorite two mana spell in the format, so I take it. It's really between meddling use and the uh, juggler. And I think you could make the case for either since they're both kind of equally off color. Um, I think two drops that are good are harder to come by, so I end up taking the juggler over it, but a little bit awkward. And then we get Niv, and I'm, I'm such a sucker for Niv. Like, don't pass me a Niv. Pick eight, I'll take it. <laughs> uh, Deadly Complication's great. It wield. Um, so yeah, I mean, we need some fixing, obviously. We haven't seen any nervous gardeners, so I know somebody in green is taking panthers and gardeners. A little bit concerning that that's going on, but we have the Niv, so if they were trying to play the long game of taking the fixing and then get Niv later, that kind of backfired on them. Um, another juggler, or we could diversify and take the Hellion now. Decide the Hellion's fine now that we have Niv. An agent is playable if we need to. Normally when I play Niv decks, I like to be a green-white base with Buried in the Garden for fixing, obviously. Um, and playing a lot of disguise cards, but uh, it's okay that we're looking a little bit more Mardu Niv. Um, it's a little concerning because obviously Buried in the Garden is double off and then this pack. Oh my gosh, it is two mythics and a rare. Um, I don't think I've ever seen this in my life. And it it's the question of, is Argus Koss or Vanifer stronger? Or is Deadly Cover-Up better? Board wipes in this format are strong, but I decide I want to take a creature, and I end up taking Vanifar over Argus Kos. And I think they're pretty equal, but Vanifar gives me a lot of creatures and a lot of flexibility, so she was the one I took. Um, I don't think there was a wrong pick there. <laughs> I think even if you take the deadly cover up, you would be correct. So just a wonderful spot in pack two to be able to have so many good choices. I'm looking at a uh, whisper drinker or inside source. I think inside source looks really good here. This is when being five colors, uh, means you have to take a land over a strong card. I absolutely want this makeshift binding. I want the Phoenix. I have to take the land. It's not optional. My mana base needs it. I absolutely need this piece of fixing. I'm taking the land. Um, same here. Public Thoroughfare. All these cards are great. But the land is necessary with the uh, build I currently have going. Rewarded with Atrada. Vanifar Atrada is a good combo, so uh, that's a nice little reward. We do not need the case of the Crimson Pulse with the case of the Locked Hot House, even though I like both cards. Uh, so instead, here I get to take something else. I end up taking Graveyard Recursion because we could end up playing Mardu, where the plan is to put Niv in the graveyard with demand answers and then reanimate it with it doesn't add up and never actually cast it for five. So it's kind of like a uh, built-in backup plan of sorts was uh, my thought process there. We get a case of uh, the Shattered Pact, which is just perfect. Um, I'll probably play two or three of them if I get them. Another land is perfect. Um, Slice from Shadows over Whipcracker. And the reason why is that we are probably going to end up playing a lot of tap lands. And... Um, we're not going to be hitting two drops too often, so it's okay that we kind of are light on two drops and that we're uh, planning on taking turn two to just kind of tap lands and get fixing. Uh, make your move, double make your move is uh, a little unnecessary. This is an interesting pack. Um, we already have a lot of card advantage with the Case of Locked Hot House, so we don't need the pride for card advantage. Rookie's a great two drop, but like I said, like we kind of want to skip over our twos because we're going to be probably fixing our mana um and on that same sense like the panther does that for us right so uh, i take the panther 
immediately rewarded with a case push pull and double glint weaver and a panther all in the same pack um, absolutely incredible pack here um, I still need more fixing and I decide a second case is better than a second panther but there's so many good cards here almost anything I'd be happy wheeling uh, I really want the glint weaver though we will see uh, torch the witness for some more removal and uh, again these removal cards are late removal cards and not early game plays my fixing's pretty good at the moment, so I'm not like too concerned that I can't play multicolors, but I actually want a two drop that's easy to cast and that I don't need any specific color to cast, and that's the uh, Sanitation Automaton. Um, so I'm just going to take that and be happy with it. The uh, Surveil is really good for this deck, and I'll just follow up with another one. Uh, the double pip on murder is problematic here, so it's not under consideration. We've got plenty of removal. Shaving some cards we don't necessarily need. Um, it looks like our fixing got there, so like we don't really need to play the demand answer. It doesn't add up strategy. Um, another torch the witness really late pick six is absolutely disgusting, but um, I end up taking another land here. Um, fixing's good here, and course to kill is perfectly great instead. So fantastic. So it's going to be a messy base. I actually don't have like a definitive base color or base two colors here. Um, this is actually a really even split five color deck, um, which normally isn't something you're going for. Nice dual land pickup as well. Um, guess another juggler probably won't play it. Yes, Glint Weaver did wheel both of them. Fantastic. Um, that was really important to me. The reconstruction came around for some more value. And uh, yeah, we end up with a five color grindy deck that's going to be slow to the start with no board wipe. So our interaction removal to catch up is crucial and our ramp is really important. Um, not that we have any direct ramp. Going and getting more lands with the case of the Shattered Pact is going to be very important um, on turn two. So I'm definitely not cutting either of those or the Panther. Our big end game plays are kind of how we stabilize and win. So. I really think they need to stick around as well. Um, so really it's about how few of early game plays can I get away with not playing because I am playing five tapped lands. Um, so yeah, I mean, we're light on creatures, we're heavy on removal. I need to remove some of my worst removal spells because I just don't have space for it. Um, these are going to be later game plays. We're basically going to start on three impacting the board. Um, and so sometimes you just got to say, okay, if I'm not going to impact the board early and turn two is going to be taken off to play these tap lands, like it's okay if I go lighter on twos, you don't want to go completely empty, but, um, yeah, it's, it's a tough choice. And, um, I was willing to go that direction. Uh, the last card to cut is definitely a removal spell here. We're already really light on creatures. Um, Vanifar, of course, and Atrata will get us more creatures than what it looks like, and uh, A Killer Among Us is also creatures, uh, but I do want to be careful to make sure that we don't go necessarily under 12 here, especially with Case of Locked Hothouse. Um, we just need more spells we can cast off of Case of Locked Hothouse as well. So people ask me about my mana bases all the time, and this is me counting my mana base, and like, I'm just going to say this mana base is absolutely incredible. Um, it's so much better than it looks. We've got two cases of the Shire Pact, with, which count as one color each for every single one of our colors. So same with these thoroughfares. They're all one color each of each color we have. So it's already five sources, no matter what. <laughs> Here we have eight planes, eight islands, 10 swamps, nine mountains, and 10 forests. So uh, the panther goes and gets the extra sources, uh, case, thoroughfares. Yeah, absolutely incredible. 
So if you are going to run an even split, obviously this is the kind of mana base that you are always going to be aiming for in terms of flexibility to make sure you can cast all of your different spells. And uh, people who watch the channel always ask me, you know, do you play five colors all the time? And, you know, do the drafts go poorly? And, you know, does it ever backfire? And, and I always tell them, like, not really. <laughs> um, it does go well. I decided to grab a forest, even though we have more of them than any other source, uh, because that's how the panther gets other colors. And we get a little bit punished by drawing a forest immediately. Uh, there was temptation to get red so that Dog Walker could flip, um, but I'm giving that up for a safer mana base to go get my other fixing. Obviously, drawing it doesn't add up is not ideal uh, in that situation either when I'm looking to get all my colors on board as fast as possible. And our opponent is missing their lands, so that also is just a really nice grace period that we got there. Some temptation to uh, automaton here, uh, but I just decided we go with uh, Killer Among Us to put a lot of pressure on the board with our opponent only having three mana. Um, this is just extreme pressure for them to have to deal with. Now we can surveil. I'm going to keep that. Um... There's no reason to not play out the land, especially since we have Case. A uh, little sad that we're one color off from solving the Shattered Pact at the moment. Um, but hey, that happens. It's not worth keeping around my green permanent just to try, um, especially since I know I'm, I topped a land. The juggler. So yeah, I'm okay if they block um, the goblin with both, or they block my automaton with one of the two. Um, either way, it's a good to swing in for six here, and uh, see what they do. And, uh, you know, if it's a big thing that they flip, it's just a dog walker. But if it was a big thing, we had a make your move as well for defensive purposes here. So now we have all of our colors. Um, I don't really have anything in the grave that I'm super excited about yet. Uh, so I'm not really wanting to get back dog walker and uh automaton so i decide instead i'm just gonna pass and play a little bit slow and uh draw into something better the board's pretty stable and yeah i mean they have four cars they can now unload but they decide not to and they pass and there is the case this is why i play out my lands this is why you know patience is good um, the case is going to absolutely take over this game. The flyers are a little bit annoying, um, obviously. Murder's fine. It behooves me to start making trades, um, mainly because, uh, I expect to get more creatures on the board, right? Like, I'm now going to outvalue them. So, trades are good because they're not getting theirs back and I am. So, that's just the way I look at it from, from this point of view in the game. Vanifar is fantastic. Glint Weaver was kind of a bad hit since I can't cast it because <laughs> it's too expensive. Um, I decided to play out the land anyway instead of cloaking it. I'm going to cloak a different card instead. Um, 
I actually decided to click it doesn't add up since I don't have a good target for it and we have reconstruction anyway and I want to save make your move for when they flip that big face down card so those were the choices but I think land is good when you have case just so you can cast as many spells as possible in the turn um, I think it's okay to block I'm still waiting for them to flip and get blown out with make your move they decide not to flip. It's a little bit annoying. Uh, so. Yep. Just playing out some lands. Brick again. Uh, I will play out the Glint Weaver. And the life gain's great. This is why Glint Reaver is just such an important card in this deck, and uh, I'm glad it wheeled. Because gaining life when you're playing a deck that's so slow, um, and that you know is slow, is uh, crucial for stabilization. And, uh, yeah, I mean, they're not flipping their face down creatures, so I don't need to make your move anymore. Now, they could eat this. And they do end up eating this, I believe, with a uh, offender at large. But I was okay doing this because I have reconstruction. And I can cast it this turn as well. So that's great value for us. They have Rakdos. Um, not going to lie, Rakdos is a huge problem quite literally. Um, I decide not to block with my 4-4. Four, four. I do go face down here to see what's underneath. It's a torch that's going to be perfect for Rakdos. Um, I could cloak the land. Um, and I decide to do that instead of being able to flip my dog this turn, just to put as large of a board presence as possible here. Um, but knowing that Torch is coming up for Rakdos is really nice. And if they're not careful, I can kill them on the back crack here. do block the flyer this time. Um, I still think they have a trick. But this time my board's like so dominant that it's okay. You know, it's something I'm fine with. And obviously it was the follow-up blood splatter analysis. Um, so when we kill Rakdos, they can obviously get it back with that eventually. Um, not happy they off my Vanifar. I'm not ready to sack my permanents yet, so card advantage for them is fine. I decided to go ahead and lead on the second case. Unfortunately, grabbing the land does shuffle. Um, buried in the garden away, but we have the Torch the witness anyway. Got several things I can flip. Um, decide to crack the clue to get the spell out of the way to see what we get. So. interesting they block that one because it's the only one that I can get on board value by flipping so uh, I wanted to play inside source and just trade with whatever they blocked but um, dog walker getting value is probably better than just playing out the inside source
And now by the time the uh, splatter analysis solves, um, it'll be just a little bit too late and too slow. Although I was surprised at how many uh, things they put up on the board. But I think, uh, yeah, I think it's pretty much over if I just keep making trades. I was just uh, trying to calculate if extract the confession pre-combat won me this game and it did not. So I was comfortable playing out the panther just to get information on what I was drawing into before swinging in. There's no reason for me to flip uh, my crocodile because still eating the one one. So the good news is we get a bit more value off the top of our library. And like I said, Rackus is just going to be a turn or two too late. Um, I can play this out full or I can... Uh, Disguise it. I decided to disguise it since uh, I'll have two lethal threats under a disguise before next turn. And uh, I also decided I do not want this automaton. And of course to kill is just disgusting sitting on top. So I decided not to play out my inside source in case they have a board wipe. But yeah, of course to kill is uh, GG. And now it's perfectly reasonable for me to sack my cases and not give them two more cards. GG. That was a pretty fun game. Lots of value uh, from both players and uh, good decks. <laughs> uh. it's fine because uh, I can double cast it with extract a confession next turn and get another surveil value leaving the land on top uh, and then we have all five colors by the way on turn five uh, not that that matters with our current hand but yeah feels good whenever you're playing five colors and you just get all five right away jace And there's Niv. Um, I have never had somebody play Jace against me before on this format till this game, so uh, it was pretty cool seeing them try and self mill. I mean, obviously their whole deck was built around them drawing as many cards as possible and milling. Um, so it's just, it was really cool to see uh, somebody try and do that. Obviously, um, this game isn't going particularly well because we can just, of course, kill the smuggler um, and swing him for eight to face and two at Jace. Uh, but yeah, it's a very cool win con. Um, I thought it was neat to see somebody at least trying it, um, and I enjoyed watching them.
trying to remember uh, what this game was like. Uh, nice person saying hello. I said hello back. Maybe they're a friend of the channel. I do not know. Um, their deck was cool. Yeah, that's right. They were playing. Um, yeah, they were playing Bant Detectives. Uh, very cool deck coming up here, and um, I'm gonna be honest. They get me on the back foot pretty good. So, uh, previous opponent playing Jace. This opponent did some uh, pretty cool things, in my opinion. Uh, just decide to go ahead and get rid of the private eye. And then they go into a uh, Proft, the Elquist Proft. Um, I have to play my Fixing so that I can bury it in the garden next turn. Um, it's not really optional there. You never like taking turn four off, but as far as I'm concerned, that was something we had to do. And now, I, I think they should be sacking the clue, but maybe not. Um, I'm hoping they don't so that, uh, they don't get any value off of it, right? And odds are, like, if they play this on turn four or three, right, uh, they're going to want to add it to the board after, which is what they do. And I think that's the right choice by them. Um, you know, obviously it doesn't go very well because we have buried in the garden, but, um, you know, they're still ahead here for sure. And then they played Tulsmere. And I was just like, oh. Oh no. Uh, but we rip Vanifar. And we have a Trotta. And so uh, I decide, you know, obviously whatever I put down the 5-5 five five is going to eat it. Um, so I need to put down the Death Toucher and Vanifar and one other creature. So that I have something that can kill the wolf. No matter what they decide to block it. And I have something that can kill the Tulsmere as well in the same turn. Then we're back to just having the inside source and the 2-2 detective to deal with. Um, but I am really, really far on the back foot. And I know that this Glint Weaver and Killer Among Us need to rally us from this insane uh, play by our opponent. Private Eye into Alquist Prof, into Inside Source, into Tulsmere was pretty, pretty disgusting. Um, any removal here and we're just in a horrible spot. Uh, so I am putting them on having a trick and I actively decide that, um, it's most likely the plus three plus three. And um, even though they get to eat both creatures, if I put Atrada and Vanifar on the wolf, it at least kills the wolf. They could save Tulsmere here um, instead of trading, but it would mean that they only take Vanifar or Atrada, and I just don't think they're going to make that trade. I think they want to take both of those creatures. So um, this is kind of my way of forcing the trade on both creatures. Uh, no matter what they decide. And they surprise me with Burden of Proof. And then they do Auspicious Arrival there. And I was sitting there going, do they have Graveyard Recursion? So now I'm worried about Graveyard Recursion because um, obviously they didn't save Tolsmir there. And uh, honestly, looking back at it, I think they just made a, a small mistake. Um, but, I mean, either way, it was still just an absolutely disgusting curve out by them. And, a uh, very cool deck. Uh, Glint Weaver obviously stabilized us here pretty well. Um, obviously, they probably have another auspicious arrival. I'm definitely not blocking this. There's no way I'm blocking this. I can't afford... Um, to lose my board presence. It's another burden of proof, which I also was like surprised about, but we ripped Niv. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's quite the card to uh, pull off the top. Now 
than they ripped coat. <laughs> so obviously I have a clock. Um, Niv with Dog Walker on board uh, can ping for two and gain two. So um, he kind of offsets the coat in a weird way, but was not thrilled about that and uh, I decide instead of Among Us to go ahead and play out the dog walker so that I can ping for two and kill a detective um, and unfortunately because of the way it tapped the mana uh, to flip the dog walker I can't actually pay the ward this turn so I can't target the coat but I can target the 2-2 uh, detective token they decide to block with the coat anyway so uh I was pretty thrilled about that. Makes most sense to just clear the board, draw some cards, play out the land, um, case the locked hot house solves next turn, and uh, we should just run away with value. This is a pretty cool game where, um, you know, our opponent had an insane curve out, and uh, I think we made some really nice strategic blocks and uh, non-blocks as well to just eke out enough value throughout the turns to pull ahead um, and to end it at 16 life and them at 17 uh, with me having my final plays in hand or you know, that's a strong place to be I like getting myself into those places in these kind of games um, just checking their card count my card count we're definitely halfway through our decks so it's time to start just rolling and popping off. Decide not to attack with Dog Walker. Um, they can block with the Scholar, obviously, but Dog Walker is my second uh, dual color permanent at the moment, and I'm not willing to give that up for Niv quite yet. I am nervous about, you know, board wipes, obviously in double white, no witnesses, but um, if we can fade that, we're looking really, really good. We don't need the extra land at this point. Another uh, two colors. <laughs> Decided to give my uh, goblin the menace since it'll be attacking it on ground and it'll force the double block with it. Um, And the next turn we can swing out for lethal. Shoot to face for three, gain three, draw three. Solve the case. <laughs> um, yeah, this is just what popping off looks like. I'll kill the coat since they don't have mana to return to hand. And uh, yeah. This is the power of the case of the locked hothouse. Good game. I enjoyed that game. I, uh, I enjoyed their deck. Uh, I think they had a very cool deck. On to the next game. And we're already very far behind. Um, so this game is all about how do I mitigate the damage I take till I can uh, stabilize here. And so uh, I just have to block absolutely everything, even if it means they have a trick. So um, I decided I'm going to try and eat the 1-1 one -one and force the trick out of the hand this way. Um, because I figured they'd have me either way. Which they did. So this is just going to be a setup turn. I'm going to extract confession uh, and I will make them sack a 2-2. Two -two. Go get land. Um, it's good for our case. It's also just 
good for everything else uh, since everything is a five drop in our hand right now <laughs> basically um, the fact they pumped to hit four was a bit surprising and nice I decided the safest action is to actually course kill their phantom um, and the reason being is if they steal it back or have enchantment removal um, it'll still have summoning sickness and won't be able to attack in this turn and then they can't blow it out like if I play dog walker and they remove it yeah I have two tapped one ones but they can still attack in for three plus whatever trick they had so um, this technically bought me an extra turn so Sometimes uh, stealing the creature is better. And it worked out. Um, yeah, we just need uh, creatures. There's a binding. Um, and we're too far behind not to block, so if they attack in, we're blocking. Yep, no Doc Walker value for us. Again, I do think I need more mana, and I can make your move Vanifar. Um, make your moving Vanifar unfortunately does mean um, that I need to cloak Killer Among Us and we don't actually end up playing Killer Among Us it's just a 2-2 two -two. Um, if we were not so far behind we wouldn't have to do this but given the board state we absolutely must play out two creatures here and um, fully expect this to not trade and it doesn't um, Hellion is a huge problem, obviously. Uh, we need the case to win the game for us here. I do have to chump, but Buried in the Garden is on top and will save us from the Hellion at least. And we can do both. So we have now a trump blocker and case. We do not want the juggler though. Lots of lands off the top is great. Deadly complication for next turn is fine. Um, but yeah, trying to turn the corner here. <laughs> Could have been worse. Unfortunately, it's a Torch the Witness on top, which means uh, no extra creature to play out this turn. So the inside source is still doing one damage to us until we uh, figure this out. Perfect. And Glint Weaver will definitely save the day. We just need to make it there. I do decide to torch the witness, the uh, inside source, so that I get the clue. Um, it is not an exciting torch the witness target, but with Glint Weaver coming up and Panther on the board and a Trot on the board, um, just having the ability to shuffle the top of our library for the case um, makes a lot of sense. And also just our opponent knows we have buried them in value. So GG. I think this is the last game I end up showing with this deck and uh, I'm I'm just gonna like full-fledged disclaimer um, say this is maybe the most frustrating game I've ever played for this set <laughs> and you'll see why um, but yeah it, I feel like I played it right um, but I don't know if you see things that went wrong, uh, let me know in the comments. 
but yeah, it, it's a this is a very interesting game to watch. Um, mainly because there are some interesting nuances that occur that uh, were unexpected. Um, I go ahead and shoot the fish because I don't want them to draw a card off it. They were tapped out, they couldn't, and it also had menace, and I can't block that. But I can block this and trade here, so um, obviously they had a trick, that's okay. I was looking for the trade, I didn't get it. Um, not hitting lands hurts, so I'm gonna go try and find a land. And I do. Um, I'm trying to decide if I have time to do dog walker or if I just need to play out something to trade with their 2-2. So I decide to play out something that can trade with the 2-2 and obviously don't give it suspect because I need it to trade. They have an escape tunnel and they crack it and they get red. And that's important. So remember, they had an escape tunnel and they went and got red. Okay, that's escape tunnel number one and they got red. They played the phoenix. They obviously need double red for the phoenix. Um, so that makes just tons of sense, right? Love to get the clan basher off the board there. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> we can't deadly complication the phoenix and it actually work. Um, so we need to get the hellion on board and online and working with reach as soon as possible. Um, but we're over two turns away from that. So I decided to lead on killer among us instead. And try to see if I can put some pressure on the board to force them to stay back and block. Um, but yeah, I mean, the Phoenix, I need to draw an answer to it sooner than later. And I have several. Um, Geardrake's obviously incredible. Um, this is escape tunnel number two hitting the battlefield. So just also want to note that, that that is the second escape tunnel. trying to decide if they uh, have enough things in their grave to be able to uh, get back the phoenix more than once than they did. So we're still missing our lands. They do need to attack in. Sure. Decide to play out Dog Walker here. And I can't extract Confession either. So they crack their escape tunnel and they go get, wait for it, another mountain. So they've had two ways of getting different land colors and both times they got colors that were already on the battlefield. So I'm beginning to think they're running it so that offender at large can attack in unblocked, right? Or uh, the bull rack, right? So I'm not actually thinking escape tunnel is for fixing at this point given what they're doing. Um, I am literally dead next turn unless I deadly complication they're geared rakes, so I do need to do that, and I need to rip something that's an answer uh, next turn for the Phoenix. Uh, so I just decide to attack in and trade here. Um, pretty dead if we do not get something, so I'm just really nervous uh, that we're just going to lose the Phoenix. I do rip buried in the garden, uh, and there was much rejoicing. I was so excited. I was like, yes, we did it. <laughs> and I can even extract a confession as well in the same turn to get rid of the tracker. So I'm feeling pretty good. Um, I decided to leave back a blocker in case they draw like a fish, right? Something with haste. Um, they do not. We can slam Niv. Um, you know, now, now this is our game to lose to shock. I'm obviously very concerned about shock. Um, so I decide that I'm going to play out the case and play out the Hellion. It's going to solve the case. I'm going to be able to P 
ping for one, gain one, get out of shock range, and then pass turn. And uh, I think that was right. Now you're about to see the most ridiculous turn I've ever seen in my life. They drop a gear drake and they crack the clue because obviously they don't have anything. Planes into Aurelia. Now, not too many turns ago, they had zero cards in hand, an escape tunnel. They cracked it and got a third red source. A third red source, not white. They had no cards in hand, which means off that gear drake, they had to have planes or Aurelia in hand and draw the planes or Aurelia here. I'm livid. Okay, the dude had two other times to go and get the white source, and they didn't. How am I supposed to play around that splash and that haste creature? I don't think I do. Brutal. Brutal. I mean, yeah. And then I go into my next draft, and we get this pack. I just take bite down on crime. This whole pack is terrible. <laughs> um, Panther just to stay open and flexible. So when packs are bad, like, Fuss Bother is good too, um, but when packs are bad, like, I want to stay open to whatever I opened in pack two or three instead. That's going to be more meaningful. Um, here it's fixing with the Case of the Shattered Pack or Enforcer, a really good two drop. So um, this is a much more difficult decision. I end up taking the Enforcer because it is that much better of a two drop. And I can follow it up with either Extract Confession or a Market Watch Phantom. I decide to go with Extract a Confession even though it's not white and I just took a white card. Here's why. There's so many battle tricks in the format and Extract Confession is the perfect two drop for me. I just want to remove their creature for my turn two. That's what I want to do every turn two. I just want to be like, okay, get rid of it. So I take Extract Confession. Another shot at a panther or a projector inspector. Um, I think you could make a case for either. I decided to double down on the panther since I already have one. And I just want to make sure I have that fixing and those options later in the draft. Same thing here. Uh, triple panther or we could take like a gadget technician or a fender at large. I end up taking another panther. Um, this one might surprise people but I end up taking the examiner over the crowd control warden. And uh, the reason why I end up taking the examiner over it is we already have Triple Panther, which is just perfect for collect evidence, right? So um, I decide there is the possibility that we want to be a collect evidence deck, given that we already have three Panthers. Um, Consultant's a great two drop in white, so obviously back to the white plan. Um, Alibi is fine in green. I'm definitely playing green at this point. Auspicious Arrivals, a fine trick in white. Um, but yeah, these are kind of our hedge bets to go with Panther. But, you know, white green right now looks obviously the most open. Um, Offender at large is also decently playable if we end up in red or in some sort of five color brew. Fanatical strength is a great late pickup as well. And I'm not going to play due diligence. And we open Tasa again. Um, <laughs> I could take the Rome Brute. Uh, I think Tasa is just so much better. Um, and that makes our Extract Confessions good. And I do not need convincing to play Abzan in this format. I will play it any time. More interestingly, though, we could take a Gardener here for fixing, even though we have very good fixing already. Or uh, we can hedge back on the Private Eye and go for Color Detectives. Um, and I really like that plan. Private Eye with Tasa is uh, incredible, and we get a chance for another Private Eye. Uh, so we double down Private Eyes, but... Private Eye with Tesa, basically, you sack the clue to get the spirit. You make the Private Eye or a detective unblockable. You get another clue because you make contact, obviously, because you can't be blocked. And then you just rinse and repeat. So it's a disgusting uh, little Esper combination in the format that, um, given our fix, I'm more than happy to play uh, all four colors. And then a land. A perfect land at that, yeah. I mean, black-green is exactly what you're looking for in this situation. Uh, we do kind of have a chalk outline deck. Um, I don't like chalk outline. I'll say it a million times. I just do not. Um, we have Fae Flight as well as pretty good or a dramatic accusation. I decided to take the accusation for a little bit more interaction and removal. And if chalk outline loves us, it will come back to us. Uh, 
Uh, Gadgeteer or push pull. I just think push pull is so much better than Gadgeteer. Uh, push pull in any deck where I'm playing black is a must. Um, I could take roots here though. I did pass the chalk. I'm going to take the roots though. I actually like roots more than chalk. Um, roots is cheaper to invest in and it snowballs more like, you know, you get bigger creatures from roots. So uh, taking the maverick to go with the roots seems decent, but yeah, I like roots. Um, if I have to choose between chalk outline or roots, I'm going to take roots every time. The Lamasu is probably not going to get played, but it is a white spell in case we need it. Um, I mean, same with the, the 110. I actually like the card. <laughs> um, another graveyard shenanigan card. And look at that. Chalk Outline came back because it loves us. Infinite Zoni, right? I mean, passing our third private eye is fine. Azoni is also a detective, um, which is incredible. There's so many good wheels here. Uh, but yeah, you don't pass Izoni, especially since we're already playing the four colors. And, you know, Izoni fits perfectly into the deck. Um, fits perfectly with Roots, fits perfectly with Chalk Outline. It makes our blue a little bit more awkward. Like maybe I just want to go Abzan. Uh, no witnesses, a board wipe, or hard hitting questions. Uh, or on the job, I mean, they're all reasonable, or mutation even, um, but board wipes are OP in the format, so I take the board wipe. Um, yeah, I just, I think I want more things in my grave. Uh, I have so many things that want collect evidence that are expensive that, like, more fixing, more panthers, um, I mean, they're slow, obviously, but... I do need them in my grave, and I have a lot of ways to redeem that graveyard value as well. Same here. Like, I like the Radical. I like Killer Among Us. I like, you know, the Hellion. Um, but I just think Bike Down on Crime goes with the graveyard shenanigans a bit better. Um, and so it's just the take. Late Gear Drake, but I'm going to take my first Reconstruction now that we have Izoni and Tesa and several cards that we definitely want to get back from the grave if they go there. And with a board wipe, obviously, we have a pretty high probability of sending some nice cards to the grave of our own as well. Second roots. So now we could have two roots plus a chalk. Um, nothing else here really is grabbing my attention that I need, so I just take the roots just in case. Buried in the Garden is fantastic pick seven. Uh, there was another chalk outline there too, if you did not notice. Um, uh, blue is looking like we don't have to play it. Um, I think you could build this deck and not play blue. I will say that. Uh, Tipster looks good just for ramp. Like, if I can get Izoni on turn 5 instead of turn 6, it seems good. Inspector wheeling is disgusting, but remember, our opening pack was pretty disgusting to begin with. Um... Yeah, and so I'm in this interesting place where we have the fixing to play all four colors if I want to, but also, you know, just having Tesa and Izoni more consistently on turn is really nice too. Um, Trample in the Garden seems okay over second auspicious arrival. I decide that um, the private eyes are worth it because we have so many detectives and we are making detectives with the chalk outline at this moment as well. Um, and private eyes are just such a good target for removal early that it can take pressure off by the time Izoni or Tesa resolve. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's just a matter of me looking at my mana base and seeing what I'm comfortable with at this point. But um, lots of viable options of not playing blue or definitely playing blue. Uh, I decide that the weakest thing I have going are the roots and the chalk outline and all the graveyard shenanigans. I actually end up cutting all of that and keeping all the detectives instead. Might be an unpopular decision, but uh, it works out, okay? And as cool as Roots can be and as cool as Chalk Outline can be, I think this was the right choice in terms of uh, 
if you want wins. And I do end up bringing in the tipster over the evidence examiner as well. Um, just for the reason, as said before, a, a turn five Azoni, you know, those earlier turns where you can play Buried in the Garden or um, some of our better expensive spells. So I'm not playing tipster because we have a lot of uh, things that can go down as uh, disguised creatures. I'm playing it just as a ramp card, um, which is uh, an interesting choice. Some people maybe wouldn't do that. Uh, I, I think it's a good choice. Last cut's either going to be a Fanatical Strength or Auspicious Arrival. Obviously, both have merit. Um, I like Strength over Arrival, uh, but it's real close. You could do either way. Um, I end up cutting Arrival. But this is how I run it, and uh, this is trying to go for Mythic. Uh, we are halfway into Diamond 1 here at the start of this draft, and... Uh, I think we just need three wins in a row to hit Mythic. So let's hope we can do it. Board wipe in hand is something I'm pretty much never going to pitch. Especially when I have ways to get the fixing for the board wipe like the Panther. And remember, we're running the Panthers, uh, not necessarily as creatures. I mean, they can be creatures, obviously. Uh, we're running them for Izoni and uh, Bite Down on Crime and just all of our uh, graveyard fuel for collect evidence. So uh, no hesitation in ditching um, my Panthers to the grave. And running out the Private Eye in turn three is perfect uh, because it basically will make my opponent respond to it. And if I block here, it's super sus, so I decide not to block. Nobody in their right mind would trade a private eye for a courier, so um, blocking would do me no favors in terms of making my opponent extend to the board. Um, interesting enough, there's the combo. Um, so I'm put in this awkward situation where, like, do I extend my combo to the board? Um... I think it's right to do it. Um, it's going to force them to have an even stronger response of their own. And um, we do have graveyard recursion in several ways, including push-pull currently in our hand. Um, not that I would pull both of those creatures for that combo for one turn. I'd definitely just pull the Panthers, but um, deciding to go for the clue draw card value and... Uh, perfectly aware that um, I'll be probably board wiping my own combo. We have a good turn here though and uh, this is the combo that I'm talking about. We will bite down on crime to get rid of the vigilante but we're also going to sack the clue and make the private eye not be blockable so we're going to get in for five damage here. Uh, which is, you know, in my opinion, absolutely incredible. Um, plus make another clue. So. This is definitely a reason to play um, Esper together. Teso with Private Eye is a, uh, definitely a match that is nice. And that actually helps us. <laughs> that bounce was like perfect. For us, um, I was pretty happy about that bounce. <laughs> I don't think our opponent realized that they were helping us there, um, but yeah, that was a big deal. And I decided instead of making my private eye not be blocked, um, I'd rather play my perimeter forcer out after the board wipe. So I go ahead and attack in, and you know if they block, they block, but if they don't which they didn't. I get in for three before the board wipe. And then I can play out my planes and uh, get a perimeter forcer out there to start triggering Tesa again. Disgusting. <laughs> Private eye of their own. Um, I am at nine life, so I do need to be careful. But 
there's no reason to not just swing in here. I am going to block with my 1-1 one, one spirit here, uh, just to preserve life total. And then they have a pretty decent follow-up where they get a Thopter that can uh, block my Perimeter Enforcer. Luckily we do have Consultant to uh, make our Perimeter Enforcer larger, and then we drew into a Private Eye, which is, you know, equally disgusting. Uh, wish I had held off on a clue. Uh, if I had known I was drawing Private Eye, I would have, but did not know I was going to draw the perfect card. Um, and I just decided, like, hey, let's gain as much life as possible this turn, right? And because the Private Eye can give creatures... Um, not being able to block, I decided to just go ahead and uh, push the private eye. And they have a counter spell, which is fine. And they decide they're too far behind. So, GG. Two more wins to Mythic. Let's go. I love that our opponent already only has one card left in hand. They are an Amulgan, um, but we have a board wipe, and there's no reason for me to run anything out onto the board here. They're only going to hit us for three max this turn anyway, um, and I'm more than happy to trade that for uh, keeping my creatures. Extract Confession follow-up here is absolutely brutal, um, especially since we can also play out our tipster. I do want to draw some creatures, though. I will uh, say that, that our hand is a little bit awkward in that I don't have any creatures at the moment. Um, and we have to cycle this one, so... Uh, the good news is, is we can cycle this one, get it back this turn with the reconstruction, um, but yeah, not ideal. I decided to get the, uh, V2 Gazi Inspector instead of the Tipster, uh, because worst case scenario, the Panther can go get another land, and I'm already at six at that point, and then I have all the lands I need, uh, so I just wanted a better blocker. A little bit punished, though, because we drew Izoni. But yet again, I'm more than happy to throw my panther right back into the graveyard for I zone need to gobble it up later. And I detect, I decide because they have a eavesdropper on the board, there's just no reason to gain the two life or drain my graveyard of resources. Um, no blocks here. And I think this is just a very simple slam your best card. They kill it. Uh, we have pull. We can do it again next turn anyway. So just a really busted card. <laughs> uh, 
pack three open. Don't mind. And, you know, that's part of the reward, right? You know, people ask me, why do you draft three, four, or five colors? Well, it's because when I open my pack three and it's an Izoni, um, I don't put myself in a situation where I have to say no to that, right? I mean, if you're more narrow and specific and you don't take the fixing and you don't uh, leave yourself open to those options, then yeah, you won't be able to take the Izoni every time you, you open it pack three. And, um, you know, I, I definitely prefer drafting the style that allows me to say yes late. And uh, this is just where we obviously run away with the game. Um, there's no way they come back from this, ever. <laughs> Even if they have their own board wipe, uh, push, pull, Izoni, and Panther win it. So uh, it's just absolutely disgusting. And uh, yeah, this, uh, this win means that we are one game away from Mythic now. Um, and I was feeling really good and really confident. Uh, you know, a good deck going into Diamond 1, trying to get into Mythic is uh, definitely a confidence booster. And Alberta Beef is the opponent trying to keep us out of Mythic. We have Izoni in hand, and I don't know how you turn this down. Tunnel Tipster to Ramp and Izoni. We have the makings of a turn 5 Izoni, even though little bit light on creatures, but I'm happy to see land, and there is the fifth land. So I'm not going to put that in the grave. I'm going to keep the lands, and the whole game plan is push out Izoni as soon as possible, and hopefully not die in the meantime. Um, this turn is interesting. So I decided to take a pretty aggressive line, and use my bite down on crime on their consultant. Uh, and here's why, right? I need the four mana spell in my grave for when Izoni hits the board two turns from now. Um, there is not an opportunity for me to do that to the face down creature anyway. You know, I'll never have enough mana to pay the ward and do it. Um, so for me, it makes most sense to just go ahead and get rid of of the one extra damage. Um, and it did force them to have a very aggressive response by double casting, um, which is equally concerning. Because now I'm thinking on the job, they have some sort of way to capitalize on those two creatures being on the board. Um, and I have to block here. And I am well aware that they're going to have on the job or some sort of trick to blow me out. But I also just can't afford to not block, right? Uh, it's 9, 13 damage if I don't block at all. So... I have to give up my Izoni next turn in order to buy some time this turn. Um, so that is just the unfortunate way of it. And uh, luckily, it's just a gatekeeper they decided to do. And I take five. It doesn't feel good, but that's where we were at. And luckily, I also drew another creature. So um, I still put them on having on the job. You don't run out those cards the way they did unless you definitely have... A group pump. Um, so for on the job, I decided to go two damage there and then force it in order for the red herring to kill me. If I go on the gatekeeper, I prevent one extra damage, but it's not a force to use your trick. Um, and I wanted them to use it before Izoni hit the board anyway. So we're at five. Can we come back? Is this it? Um, Izoni will get two triggers. We have exactly four mana worth of spells in the grave at the moment. Bother is not what I wanted to see in this situation at all. Um, I decided to bite down on crime a Thopter. And here's why. Uh, I want them to trade with the Izoni. Like, I can win this game uh, with four 2-1 reach menaces. Uh, and if I don't attack with Izoni, there's no way they do it. And I can't attack with all because they can kill me on the back crack and simply not block. So, um, yeah, I can only attack with the two, but I do want them to be tempted to get the gatekeeper and a Thopter off the board by killing Izoni. So, but Izoni sometimes has got to go and I need to bait them into wanting to do that because I don't think they would just chump with double Thopter, um, 
you know, and I, I just needed them to have less on the board. And so that is a trade I'm willing to make to keep the board clear. Same here. Like, I'm not excited to give up a Reach Menace Spider for a 1-1, but uh, I don't think I'm in a position where I can't do that. And uh, now we have not only stabilized, but we're winning, so we can attack in for two here and keep back the two blockers for the uh, Phantoms in case they get flying. And uh, Panther is huge pressure. Huge pressure. So I think we've turned the corner. They pass. Obviously, we topped the land as well. Uh, but we are able to attack in and keep the pressure up. And so they have this turn. So um, I have to block. If I block only one of them, I have lethal on the back crack. I can lose to a weapon, concealed weapon, but that's it. Uh, I'm assuming it's a fender at large, and that's what it was. So luckily I went to one. I have it on the back crack. GG. Um, but that was definitely a risky non-block, but I did it so that I could have it on the back crack and uh, paid out. So that is how I got up to Mythic for our MKM, and um, yeah, it was pretty quick. Um, and I did it using four five-color drafts the whole way through. Anyway, thanks for supporting the channel, and uh, I will see you when I'm drafting Outlaws of Thunder Junction later this week.